Hey guys, just a quick message before the episode from me, Nezi. First of all, a huge apology for the delay on this episode. Jin and I started recording back in January, and due to scheduling conflicts, we weren't able to finish until March. You might be able to tell when the March recording started. Anyway, the rest of the delay was due to my own schedule issues, as well as familiarizing myself with the editing process and audacity. With luck, the next episode, which has already been recorded, won't take as long to finish. At any rate, we hope you enjoy this episode. And Chain's dramatic voice! <laughs> and with that... The following program contains spoilers, and some language unsuitable for young audiences. Not a lot, but it's in there. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and others. My name is Chain of Fire, and welcome to today's edition of The Round Room. Yay! <laughs> I am Chain of Fire, editor of the Keyhole and Kingdom Hearts Wiki, and with me today is the lovely editor, Newmans. Hey, y'all. As always, I am administrator and bureaucrat at the Kingdom Hearts Wiki at khwiki.com. And that is all that's going to be here today. Uh, to start out, we are going to uh, be going on with the news. Quick news roundup. Mm -hmm. As of earlier this month, actually a few days ago I believe, Kingdom Hearts Kai has released a little information that we're not really sure what to do with it. But, but it's exciting. Uh, it is, in fact, exciting. Um, in one of the cutscenes, if you could call them those, um, Terithi, the little cat follower thing person, that's following you around. Spirit animal. Is a spirit. Literally a spirit animal. Literally. Because as its cape flies up, it reveals the spirit symbol on a dream eater. So, thoughts on this, Nezzy? Well, it's kind of interesting that we are apparently seeing a dream eater that has... Well, aside from the fact that we're seeing Dream Eaters in new installments of the series, the fact that Chirithi is a Dream Eater, it kind of has a lot of big implications about the goings-on of Kingdom Hearts Kai right now, because the story is starting to get a little more plot-related. We've had hints of the importance of the Book of Prophecy. Is that that's what it's called? Yeah, the Book of Prophecies. And the history between the heads of the guilds and a mysterious black-coated figure. And recently, with the introduction of Ephemera, we're learning, or it seems that we will be learning very important things about the world of Kingdom Hearts Kai and how it relates to uh, the rest of the series, especially the Keyblade War, since, uh, in theory, that's what... Kingdom Hearts Kai is leading up to. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that Chirithi is a dream eater that is capable of communicating, which is not really something we saw in Kingdom Hearts 3D, so it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it's kind of inching towards the end, which will be the inevitable uh, Keyblade War, if that is how they plan to end this. But it's, it's getting closer and closer to there, which I'm kind of happy to be seeing as it seem to be slow paced up until now. Have they they at haven't least uh, mentioned when they're gonna stop updating, have they? At all? No, no, they haven't. Or when well, when and if they have localized it to the US and other regions of the world. Yeah. For now that seems unlikely. Mm -hmm. But we can dream. Yeah. And you no know, pun intended. Uh, what's interesting about the fact that the revelation we had about Chirithi is mm -hmm. that at one point, I think we had a cutscene where we saw the creation of at least one of them. And I'm looking at the screenshot that we have, and he's being, I guess, created in a beaker, in a bottle, a, sci a, a scientific beaker or something. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't seen that cutscene or... Uh... I don't remember the cutscene, but I... Or screenshot myself, but... Um, but that is quite an interesting thing, if you consider uh, the whole Holobastian scientists and all. Yeah. And I kind of wonder, uh, do you, since the players 
Chirithi is a spirit dream eater. Uh, what do you think the odds are of Ephemera's Chirithi being a nightmare, since it's now a, well, a different color? Or mm -hmm. slightly I'm different shape? I'm thinking so. Yeah. I think it will be a, uh, I thought that was something that was revealed, but I'm pretty sure it'll be a nightmare, since, you know, they're kind of the counterpart, and since one is a spirit accordingly, uh, the other Trithi will follow suit. That might be a direction it's going. Mm hmm That's what I think it'll be doing. I'm sure it'll be revealed soon. Or not. For all we know, they could throw a curveball at us like they have in the past. Well, I'll tell you this. If if the next time we see that one, it's even more different, like it's going through stages, then I mm -hmm. get the feeling that it's probably going to turn out to be a nightmare, at least at the end. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I'm leaning towards as well. But yeah, so that was an interesting reveal on Square Enix's part. Yeah. And Any, you know anything else? You know what's funny? Um, when I found out about that update, I kind of thought, huh, does he kind of look like a Meow Wow? And I had to go back and look, because, mm -hmm. you know, he's kind of a cat-dog-like creature, even though he is, you know, he doesn't look exactly like one of those guys, right. but there are hmm. little points that kind of have a little bit of a relation. Yeah, I can see that a little bit. He's definitely leaning more towards cat than he is dog. Yeah, a little bit. But that, that was an interesting revelation. And bringing about that as well, uh, that kind of brings into question uh, what Kingdom Hearts Kai is. Is it really a dream? Taking place in the realm of sleep, or... Uh, What's what's going on there? That's a that is a good question. Although but of course that we did see in Kingdom Hearts 3D that it is possible for a spirit to exist in the real world. Uh, when did we uh, see that? Uh, Riku. He was in his spirit form when he was in the last stage of the world that never was. Oh, that's true. Yeah, and they were. And he used his spirits in the world that ever was as well against the battle with Young Xanort. So, right, it's kind of a sketchy line there. I, I a rather blurry line. Maybe I keep forgetting that that's not actually in the dream world, but it is. But it's not. But something. It's a little confusing. But you know, this is kind of an interesting thing that they have. This is only the. How should I say this? The first two enemy types that we saw in the Kingdom Hearts series have made multiple appearances. Mm -hmm. The last two, up to now, have not. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, it's kind of interesting to see Dream Eaters, where we thought they would end, stay in Dream Drop, uh, kind of go past that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now we just wait for the Unverse to make their breakthrough again, <laughs> in a sense. Won't that be fun? Hmm. Maybe they'll make an appearance along Venitas or Ventus or something in three years. Who knows? It's Square Enix, so you can never really tell. But um, think that if it was taking place in the realm of sleep, that would explain its canonicity as far as it's kind of canon, but it's not, but it sort of is, <laughs> but it's sort of not, in a sense. Right. So that would help explain things a lot. Um, unless you have anything else to add to that? Not really. We're just waiting on what the next twist is going to be. Mm-hmm. And we're very excited to hear it as well. Right, yeah. Right now, they're kind of poised to make uh, some kind of story plot-related event. So we'll just have to see what it is. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it'll be soon. But in other news, a new uh, soundtrack is being released called the Kingdom Hearts Tribute Album. Um, it will be released on March 25th, and it will feature um, the songs. following tracks. Yeah, songs. <laughs> yeah, it will feature songs. But it will be uh, the three main characters' themes being Riku's theme, Sora's, and Kairi's. It will feature Always On My Mind, Rage Awakened, Dearly Beloved, Hollow Bastion, Hand in Hand, March Caprice, which I found an interesting thing to put on there, uh, 13th Struggle, A Piece of Peace, and Traverse Town. Traverse and Town it will is feature... an one. Yeah, that's pretty. That's not one you see going back to a lot often, that and March Caprice as well. Uh, as well as a piece of peace, so it's good to see some a little diversity in there. Which one was piece of peace? Piece of peace was the one 
Oh, I don't remember when it played, and I can't think of it right now. It was one of those ex obscure ones that only played, like, once. It was either in the first game, or it was in Chain of Memories. I can't remember which. I will have to look it up in a minute here. But this album will not be done by Yoko Shimomura. Pardon my slaughtering of her last name. Shimomura. All right. Like that. And I but think Ms. that Yoko. is everything... We need to cover about uh, the tribute album. album. You can look up. Uh, Instead, it will be a bunch of different artists which are contributing to the album online at the moment. Either, but it will feature 13, plenty of other artists. Kingdom Hearts Wiki, The Keyhole, and Cage Insider, um, or somewhere so on the internet, you'll be able to find it. It should be an interesting thing. Internet. You'll find to, something. And I'm excited for this. Hopefully, yeah. the right things. It's gonna be fun. And not some weird, crazy things that you can often find on the internet. But with the next piece of news, first of all, there's something we forgot. It is the new year, so. Happy New Year Oops. to all! Happy New Year Yay. and stuff. Um, so, on to the next piece of news. Goofy's voice actor, Bill Farmer, he uh, composed a tweet saying, Kingdom Hearts 3 will be released this year. And he was saying stuff like, hey, is Kingdom Hearts 3 coming out this year? And he'd be saying, like, that's what they keep telling me. And he's like, you sure it's not Dream Drop? And he's like, I think so. And people would be like, you're giving us uh, some vague information. Uh, and he's like, I tell you what I know. So voice actors don't even aren't even that much into the loop. Yeah. So basically, a bunch of people got excited a little, but there's nothing actually happening. Yep. He's The rumor was debunked by Square Enix, so there's not anything that's actually yeah. coming out, unfortunately. But, well. Oh, well. Maybe next year. Yeah. But that's all I have to say on the news. Actually, a little bit of keyhole news. Um, congratulations to Exion, who became our newest moderator at the keyhole. Well, Happy days. Well deserved. Good job. <laughs> all right. And now on to the topic of the day. All right. So we kind of almost touched on it earlier, but the Kingdom Hearts series is known for lots of crazy adventures in different worlds, and this large overarching storyline with too many turns and twists to really understand completely, let's face it. Mm -hmm. But another thing that, uh, well, pretty much any RPG has to be known for is a good cast of enemies. Mm -hmm. and, and so Square Enix gave us, throughout the different installments of the series, they've given us a good number of pretty cool enemy types and as we go on we get to see a lot of pretty exciting creatures i guess that we have to battle along the way mm -hmm. pretty cool stuff so we'll be talking about the different enemy types that we've seen in the kingdom Hearts series so far the cool ones um mm -hmm. well let's start out with the heartless i guess since that is where the beginning lies that is a big one mm-hmm they are basically the big undertone that's going throughout the series so far. Mm -hmm. there, there were a lot of... They've expanded to um, every single game except for Dream Drop, I believe. Off the top of my head. They've been... They've... Well, any proper appearances by the Heartless as a group, yeah, they did not show up in Dream Drop Distance. Mm -hmm. We had an appearance by a Heartless... Mm -hmm. But that was about it. Well, I think if you're referring to Birth by Sleep... Uh, I was talking... Well, or you mean in Dream Drop? Yeah, we had an appearance by Anson, Seeker of Darkness. Oh, that's true. That was, that was basically the only hard list that we saw in Dream Drop Distance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but other than that, we've seen them in pretty much every single game. They've come crawling in as a pretty serious force of enemies. Mm-hmm. And they were actually, uh... Dream Eaters weren't slated for Dream Drop originally, but we'll get that into once we get into the Nobodies. But I think Heartless were set to appear in there as well, weren't they? Um, maybe? I don't remember a great deal about the original trailer for Dream Drop Distance. Mm -hmm. I think it was mainly Nobodies, but I think they're the only enemy to appear in every single game in some way, shape, or form. So... Uh, favorite Heartless. Do you have? Do you happen to have like a favorite common type of Heartless at all? Oh, I'm sure I did. Oh man, let me see. So many to choose from, though. So it's a little bit hard yeah, to do. Yeah, it's crazy. All right. So anyway, 
while I look that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, Heartless are a pretty important point in the series from apparently the very beginning. Mm -hmm. They are residents of the Realm of Darkness, and apparently Master Xehanort knew about them way back in the day, mm -hmm. since he summons them during uh, Ventus's training, which, you know, goes completely bad. Right. And then, in the period between Birth by Sleep and the First Kingdom Hearts, Xehanort and the Apprentices set loose the Heartless on the world, mm -hmm. or on the Realm of Light, and they create the Emblem Heartless. Mm -hmm. And there are... The Emblem Heartless are pretty interesting if you think about them, because of how many of them like take on forms that are appropriate to a world. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting to think about. Yeah, it's really diverse, too. I like the, the amount of diversity within the Heartless versus some of the other enemy types. Yeah, and it's not like Xehanort and the others designed them that way. Mm -hmm. That would be pretty ridiculous if they did. Mm -hmm. So if you think about what that means, that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to the uh, thing with Kai... Uh, there's quite a bit of, like, unique Kai Heartless that they presented. That's true. I think part of that is because since they brought back some worlds from Birth by Sleep that, you know, didn't have Heartless the first time around, but now they get to make up whole new Heartless for the worlds. Yeah, some of them are rather interesting. There's things like, a lot of them are inanimate objects, too. But outside yeah. of that, there's a lot of seasonal-themed things as well. Like, of course, going with the season events that occur in Kai, like Halloween types, uh, such as like caramel head apples and <laughs> uh, being heartless, which is strange, but we'll go with That's it. That's true. And snowmen and such. Yeah. The fact that they uh, went with the, uh, basically the format of updating, especially on like special occasions. That gave them a pretty awesome opportunity to create a lot of really whimsical designs. Mm -hmm. Like for Valentine's Day, and then White Day, mm -hmm. and Christmas, of course, and Halloween, and let's see, what else was there? Uh, I'm sure there was there's some Easter, really... actually, which is kind of a strange <laughs> thing to design things for, but I think there might have been a Hanukkah one. I could be wrong. Maybe there mm -hmm. wasn't. I don't see it. There was something that the fireworks were for, it was some Japanese holiday, because I don't think it was for the Independence Day? Were they for New Year's? Oh, they might have been for New Year's uh, last year, or like two years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, last year's New Year's Day. Yeah. Uh, there's something There's something very Pokemon-ish about Heartless. You know, I was wondering about, about that same thing, because very, um, with the release of... Uh, I think it was black and white, they really started to delve into the inanimate object Pokemon, and then you start seeing things with Kai being all inanimate mm -hmm. object-y. I don't know, but yeah. it's just like kind of fun. Submarines and bags of jewels, it's pretty wacky. Yeah. Even this giant, giant like, mecha heartless thing called the Purple <laughs> Gummy Hound. So, don't know if that actually classifies as a gummy or is just an emblem, but still pretty neat. That's a good question. But anyway, it's pretty cool to see how creative they can get with the Heartless designs. Mm -hmm. Pretty awesome. Yeah, but... So I can't... I'm not sure if I have a favorite, but I can tell you what my least favorite one is. Oh, which, which is your least favorite? Uh, let's see. That would be the Crimson Jazz from Kingdom Hearts 2. Oh. That is by one of the most annoying... That's the one that lays the fire mines. Yes. That follow you around. What a... And the one that inflates its head. Mm -hmm. It's just so freaky and such a, an annoying enemy that even if you defeat it, you're going to be feeling it, uh, its attack for like the next 10 seconds mm -hmm. as you try to run. Mm -hmm. And what a pain in the butt it is, too. <laughs> oh. Absolutely. It looks neat, though, so we'll give it that. I mean, it kind of looks like the rest of those hat heartless. Mm -hmm. Flying hat heartless. With, that are kind of swirly. It's got kind of swirly designs, though. But outside of that, yeah, it's pretty common and only with size and a little bit of design. I wish they would have named, like, they would have had names for the families of Heartless. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Like, if they had given them, like, groupings. Mm-hmm. That, that would be we could have, cool. like, sorted them into. Mm -hmm. Like all those hat, floaty, heartless things, like the Silver Rock and the Crimson Jazz, and the Emerald Blues and whatnot. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was kind of cool. Uh, once they started introducing a whole bunch of them in days, mm-hmm. suddenly you have one of the family for almost every single one of the organization elements. Mm-hmm. I think maybe all of them. Um, I think so. There was even stuff like warping for Zigbar, which yes. I thought was in a, a rather odd um, power to have for a Heartless, but it's like, hey, it works. But yeah, they I, added things. Yeah. I think there was one for probably almost all of them. Maybe all of them. I mean, aside from maybe light. I don't know. Oh, no. Uh, no, in Kingdom Hearts 2, there was one that was light. There was lightning, but not light. No, no, no. The, I think it was the Silver Rock. Oh, that's right. Yep. I, I named that earlier. And I, wow, good job, me. Huh. Forgot about that. But, yeah. So, maybe... Was there, some, was there one for Zemnis? I... Think so. I'm looking at the days ones because I don't have a big thing for it, all of them. Oh, there's a there's one for speed. I don't know if that means anything. The Emerald Serenade that you had to defeat in the maze. Yeah, that was the one that doesn't attack at all. Yeah, maybe that was supposed to be a Zemnis. I don't know. <laughs> That was kind of an interesting boss fight too. It was annoying at some points, but eh, it's still memorable. Uh, I think as far as common, uh, non-bossy Heartless, I think one of my favorites has to be, at least like families, has to be like the different versions of the Zip Slasher, which, I mean, I think they might have all been bosses, but they were common later, so they Yeah, they the count. Blade Soldier. Yeah. All the different like types of those and how those had different elements, like the Heat Saber, Chill Ripper, Blitz Spear. Oh, I, I made that, been, that name. They okay. basically went from Armored Knight, and then they gave a lot of mm-hmm. cool uh, elemental powers to a bunch of Armored Knights. And mm-hmm. then we have the Zip Slasher and the Dual Blade and the Heat Saber, and those are pretty... Yeah, those are some Although, of my favorites. They are pretty cool. Although the Armored Knight, they, they took away the Armored Knight's pointy feet. Yeah, they did. I'm kind of disappointed about that now that I look at him, but eh. Got a funny design. Another one that was kind of like a fun little Heartless was the Lance Soldier, which was the one in Kingdom Hearts 2 where the Lance had its own personality and everything. Oh, and yeah. And sometimes it wouldn't listen to the soldier and it was like sometimes running around and hanging onto it and stuff. And it was just kind of comical to see that. It was a little bit it's Kind fun. of like a throwback to the Defender Heartless. Yeah. Um, only on a less serious note. Defenders were kind of cool looking, too. Yeah, but annoying. Uh, Pretty annoying. Oh, yeah. Definitely. But yeah, I was really happy that Days provided, like, this whole new slew of Heartless. Or at least variations of the ones we, Yeah, uh, it's nice to see Heartless having families. Mm Mm-hmm. Even if their families don't have a name. But, yeah, that's alright. Make your own names for them. I think, as far as Heartless go, Days had a lot of uh, annoying bosses that were oh, really difficult. The dust fire was... Yes. <laughs> I mean, once you finally get down the pattern, then it's just really, really slow mm-hmm. going, but yeah, there are some pretty tricky ones there. Mm-hmm. And even things, even like required ones, I remember the hardest uh, required Heartless for me was the Leech Grave. Oh, uh, yeah. That In Halloween Town. Ugh, everybody hates that. You get to that point, it's like, oh, crap. That's one of the, I think, one of the few Heartless battles that's, like, multi-part. Multi-part and multi-annoying. Ugh. Um, the Rule of the Sky, that wasn't too difficult. It was more just annoying, in a sense. And, uh... Yeah. What's the word of it? What's another word for annoying? Um... Frustrating? Frustrating, I guess. Yeah, so, something along those lines. But it was in the air, and it was on a game system which didn't let you maneuver around the air very well. <laughs> it was not built for that in a yeah. sense. You spent half that bell just trying to catch up. Mm-hmm. And even so, you didn't do very much damage when you did. Yeah. Let's see. There was the living pod, which wasn't a boss, but it was super, super deadly. Mm, the living pod? I'm trying to remember which one that is. It's the. It was a ghost. Heartless. One of the ghost types. Oh, yep. That's right. That was rather annoying as well. From what I remember. I don't remember that one too well. Yeah, I always just ran. Oh, it's the one where you break jars. Okay, I remember that. Yeah. That made the jar breaking uh, game a little more difficult. Painful. Mm Mm-hmm. But I don't think I ever, like, defeated all of those at all just because those were difficult. Something I found surprising, though, um, was Uh at the beginning of Days, 
this kind of is going into nobody's a little bit, but at the beginning of days, like day 12 or something, there's a mission that's like, uh, survive, where you, there's a bunch of dusks, and it's hard as heck, especially on prod mode, with such low levels. Right. Yet, in Kingdom Hearts 2, when you face nobodies, they do a lot less damage, even though Roxas doesn't have any of his powers, really. Of course, he is... He doesn't have much to compete with at that point, but I just found it so interesting. You're it's a little incongruity, you would say. Not incongruity, just interesting that maybe it's just like the opposite of incongruity. It shows that Roxas still attains his strength, even though he doesn't know he has it in the beginning of Kingdom Hearts Two. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh so yeah, just something I was pondering. Well pondered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's all the heartless. Uh, nothing really to say about the Gummy Heartless, because I didn't spend too much time there. Yeah, you don't really get to know them at all. They're mm-hmm. kind of wacky and interesting looking, mm-hmm. like the Reaper's Wheel with the, all the little heads poking out. Uh-huh. But, you know. Thing the mo- yeah. Out of all the ones that are, like, my favorite, I can't really say much, but I guess I would go with the Pirate Trip, because yeah. that was kind of fun. I it's and yeah I mean that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. He goes around the entire ship, and if you're you know good enough, you blow up the entire freaking ship. That's pretty awesome. It makes you feel so proud to see the ship split in half because you're like, yay, I accomplished something. Yeah, uh, you don't get that again until the dreadnought. Yeah, if you if you get the dreadnought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I haven't done. Um, and if you get the dreadnought, um, I've never actually gotten the dreadnought, so I've never unlocked this boss. But it unlocks the Hunter X. Which is apparently harder than the Dreadnought. Really? Yes. Oh. I haven't had it. It's like the big X kind of heartless thing that I've never yeah. come across it, but it looks neat. It does look pretty cool. Um, oh, and apparently it is the only heartless ship that releases a heart when it dies. None of the other ones do, apparently. Really? Uh, wait. Oh, so it's like, I guess it's a cinematic thing? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Hmm. I don't know if that's an error or a find. So, maybe it was originally meant to be in a world or something? Oh, I think maybe because it's the only Heartless in... Oh, wait, no. Oh, that's because most of the things in Kingdom Hearts 2 were nobodies. Okay. That's why I'm like, I'm sure there's something else, but a majority of things were nobodies in the second game. And the first game, I guess they were all non-emblem. Pure Bloods, that's the name of it. Pure Blood. Oh. Even though they all had the emblem on them. Hmm. All right. Well, maybe most of them were ships. I guess so. Like little heartless inside the ships and they just go crashing or something. <laughs> maybe. It's kind of weird to think about how the heartless are driving gummy ships. Mm-hmm. It's like, how did that come to happen? <laughs> it's like they had to take like a three-part course or something. <laughs> heartless <Yeah>. school. <laughs> <laughs> they take a correspondence course on flying gummy ships. Mm-hmm written test and everything. It's like, we're created to destroy, but first the test. Here you go. (laughs) And of course, there are the epic, big, heartless bosses. Mm -hmm. The World of Chaos from the first Kingdom Hearts. Oh, yeah. And the Dark Hide from Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep Final Mix. Oh, yes. The giant runaway, please don't kill me. Yeah. The one where the camera's always looking up at it. So horrifying. (laughs) Yeah. Which is kind of cool. I hope they kind of touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Another, It'd be cool if they brought him back. Yeah. Another disappointment, or at least, like, explain it a little bit, because it's just kind of like a mysterious thing. I mean, if they don't explain it, I'm not going to be too disappointed, because it's just the Heartless in the realm of darkness that's natural. I mean, it's kind of fair. Heartless are residents of the realm of darkness, mm-hmm. and in the realm of light, they're pretty much all emblem, and emblems spawn more emblems, mm-hmm. while in the realm of darkness, there's only we people. have no idea what's been going on over there. Mm-hmm. Like, huge Heartless that couldn't really be bothered to go to the Realm of Light mm-hmm. because, you know, who cares? Yeah. And, you know, if the Door to Darkness had been opened at the end of the first Kingdom Hearts, then maybe they all would have mm-hmm. shown up. Yeah. At least story-wise. Yeah, I think it, um, even though these are technically, I think they're emblem. Let me take a look here. Yeah, they are. Oh, no, they're not. Which ones? They, they are Dark Hide has a striking resemblance to the uh, Dark Thorn and Shadow Stalker. It has the same kind of look as the Dark Thorn did, I think, at yeah, least. Kind of. It's got, it's got its own twist, but... Yeah. 
it's like... <clears throat> as soon as I saw that, I thought, oh, it's like a dark thorn something or other. The pure bloods seem to grow towards certain uh, certain forms. Mm-hmm. We've got the shadows, the neo shadows. We've got the invisible and that family. Mm-hmm. And we've got the dark thorn, dark side. Yeah, shadow stalker. Yeah, now we're getting new uh, forms for the or new members of the dark side family. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's kind of a uh, neat thing to go up on. It's cool design too. It's got like purples and blues, and it's like spiky hair things that I can't describe, but I can imagine how they feel. <laughs> it's like firm hair or something. I don't know. Oh, that's that's another thing that uh, I just noticed that the dark hide has in common with the shadow stalker and the dark thorn are the chains. Oh yeah, that's true. Must be Ericus again. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Him and his chain fetish. But yeah, it's it's neat to see families that aren't families. I kind of like the shadows, or not the shadows, I kind of like Heartless as a video game enemy species. Mm -hmm. They're pretty cool. Yeah. And well, I guess with nothing else to say on the Heartless, we will move on to the second enemy that was introduced to the Kingdom Hearts series. And my personal favorite, Nobodies. Yeah. The Nobodies. Mm -hmm. So, the first time we see the Nobodies as a species mm -hmm. is in Kingdom Hearts 2. Mm -hmm. We don't get to see them in Kingdom Hearts 1, even though we get to see Zemnis, and we don't see yeah. them in uh, Chain of Memories, even though we see more organization members. Mm -hmm. But as a uh, lower form species, a if you want to call them the dumber species, if you will, versus the... Uh, there are a lot of ones. interesting comparisons you can make between like the Heartless and the Nobodies. The fact that there are so many more Heartless than Nobodies, mm -hmm. and the fact that the heart, the Nobodies are the ones that think mm -hmm. instead of feel. Which is probably why there's less, because it's like, why do I need to repopulate and make an off-brand version of me when it's like well, I'm the best? <laughs> that's an interesting question. They don't think that the people... I feel like part of it is because Nobodies probably didn't happen until Sora. Ansem. Oh, yeah. Or until Xehanort became a Heartless and a Nobody. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that it's true that Heartless can make more Heartless by consuming Hearts, but Nobodies can't really make more Nobodies. Right. There need to be more Heartless in order to be Nobodies. Yeah, and like there are very specific conditions for becoming a Nobody. Yeah, so, so that's why there's it so... It makes sense that there's so few. Yeah. Oh, something I read the other day via Tumblr that is it's kind of a theory in a sense um but in birth by sleep the people there was something in the ansem reports that said that ansem experimented on live samples as well as ones that are already deceased so it's kind of or what to turn into as far as hearts go oh. and like turning people into heartless and nobodies Mm -hmm. Which it's like kind of screwed up when you think he had to kill people to get to it. I mean, you could argue that they could have already been deceased at that point. It's sure, probably they nothing. Just sent the apprentices to go grave robbing. That's yeah, all. exactly. Which is a, which is sent also another these... funny part if you think about it that way. They sent Ienzo to go raid the graveyard. Yeah, <laughs> they just went to Halloween Town and did that. There we go. Perfect. Um, I forgot where I was going with this. It had something to do with our list of nobodies. Yeah. Well... Maybe it was just that some of them were live and others were not. Non-living. Yeah. Well, I guess since they had a lot of power, they, I'm sure they could requisition any corpses that were around for any reason. Like, for... Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know whether Radiant Garden had a medical school or not, but... It, it could have. It had a lot of things. I wouldn't be surprised if it did. So maybe they just took the cadavers from the medical college. <laughs> yeah, probably that's how it works. But knowing their motives, I'm going to bet on murder. <laughs> just jump right to murder. Anyway, I'm sure I'll find it somewhere in here. Anyway, because of the way the Nobodies were designed and incorporated into the story, they haven't seen nearly as much screen time as Heartless, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate because they look pretty cool, and there's a lot of potential for more pretty cool enemy designs in there, but we just haven't had a, much of an opportunity for that. Yeah, well, which and maybe we'll only... get to something more in the future. Yeah. Okay. So far, we've seen just the smallest henchmen, nobodies, and exactly three big nobodies. And that is, go as far as, like, 
boss forms or yeah we've seen the twilight thorn mm-hmm. we've seen marluxia's specter the one that he rides in his boss fights the thing with the head the creepy face and the scythes and stuff yeah it's actually not that creepy if you look real closely it's just wearing a hood um like really i always down. thought it looked a bit like well if you look past the hood though the there you can see like eyes and stuff and it's yeah, pretty weird. and you know, it's like the easiest to tell with a dusk. The face kind of looks most like a shadow. Mm-hmm. Like they're all like wearing hoods, and they have this jagged mouth, and sometimes you see the eyes. And... Yeah, I guess that's something I just noticed. None of them really have a face that is showing. Uh, yeah. Aside Although, from the dragoon, you can kind of see you can kind of see where their heads are. Mm-hmm. Like for the gambler, mm-hmm. actually, no, the gambler is one of the tough ones. But like the dragoon you notice that the dragon head is not really its head. Yeah, there's a little head inside it. And, like, the berserker, it's wearing, like, a hood thing. I don't know what you call that. It's, it's actually uh, kind of hard to see it, but yeah. but it's And they're all neat. fairly humanoid. Mm-hmm. And I think I remember it being in an interview where they said that as Heartless gets stronger, they become more monstrous. As nobody's become stronger, they become more human-like, or something like that. Yeah, I think that... Um, or maybe it was, or maybe they don't become, but that was just the way they were designed. The most powerful nobodies were the organization. Mm-hmm. Look, basically human. Yeah, and they even started to form their own hearts. So yeah, it's kind of neat that the lower ranking ones are the most monstrous, like the creepers in the dusks. And even so, they're not too wild at all, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, I think we can agree that we still want to see more. Nobody species. Oh, yeah, definitely. Especially since we haven't seen the minions for half the organization, mm-hmm. or almost half. But uh, what would you say is your favorite nobody type? I'm going to say, like, lower-ranking nobody. So not including any of the organization, not including, yeah. like, the World of Nothingness or Marluxia's thingy. Let's see, design-wise... Or, and, of course, I... Xion's other forms. Right. Design-wise, I think I might... It's a tough one, because there are some pretty cool ones. The samurai is very cool. Mm-hmm. Also, the sniper has got kind of an interesting look at yeah. kind of theme going on there. Mm-hmm. I think probably my favorite, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and say the samurais design-wise. Okay. Gameplay-wise, pretty cool. I guess the assassin, because he's not really all that hard, mm-hmm. though he hides in the ground most of the time. Yeah. Wamp. Like, like, he's pretty easy to deal with. Mm-hmm. My least favorite, now that's an easy one. Sorcerer? No. Oh, Dancer. no. Dancer. Oh, Screw the dancers. Sorcerer might come in second, but definitely the dancer. Mm-hmm. Um, gamblers are kind of a fun one, just because you can get so much money, you can become so rich off those, and get the uh, materials you need so easily. But I think my favorite, design-wise and gameplay-wise, has to be the Dragoon, because of They're its... Cool. Uh, because of like the reaction commands and such. Yeah. Plus they have such a, like an epic stance. They're mm-hmm. like, the most... One of the most badass ones. Yeah. And the reaction command's kind of fun, where it's the jump like Zaldan. It's one of my favorite reaction commands as well. You know what's interesting? Yeah, they're kind of a fun little breed. Yeah, but what's kind of weird is that, if I'm remembering right, in Kingdom Hearts 2, nobody's had very little drops. Like, they dropped MP most of the time, Mm -hmm. and sometimes synthesis materials, but that was about it. They almost never... Did any of them drop health? Because I don't remember um, any of them dropping out. Dusks might have at the beginning. And maybe I Creepers. Think, I think Creepers did during the Twilight Thorn battle. I'm pretty maybe, sure. Maybe during that battle. But, but I think for the most part, if you're fighting against a group of nobodies, you're not going to be picking up any health. Yeah, which is also something to consider, I guess. I don't know if that's actually canon or we're just looking too far into it. But Maybe. But yeah, it's something that is there and we accept it anyway. Um, any more, anything else to say on the nobodies? Unless you want to comment on the gummy nobodies. Oh yeah, there's those, aren't there? I forgot about those. Uh, it seems kind of like there are more nobodies around in the gummy roots than Heartless. Mm Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah, there's not very many Heartless. That's probably because, uh, I mean, I don't think we have any of the ones from the first game. Now that I look at it, I don't think we have anything from the first game on the Heartless page. Oops. Well, that's because they're all ships that appear that you can uh, build. You can get the blueprints for them. Yeah. So they're really not very unique as Heartless. Yeah, they're just that's true. gummy ships that are enemies, and maybe they happen to be Heartless. Mm-hmm. I think in the Final Mix version, though, I was playing, and I noticed there were some different Heartless. 
So I think, like, the Final Mix version, I don't know about if they did it with the HD remix, but there's some different designs in the Final Mix 1 version, so that's kind of fun. It's interesting to think that there are actually more nobodies in gummy ships than there are in the world. Well, if you think about how advanced they are, it makes sense a little bit. Like, oh, we need more ships. Let's make more ships, because... Yeah, if you think about the, <laughs> the ridiculously huge gummy ships, the cruisers and the dreadnoughts. Mm-hmm. Why did they find all this time? <laughs> I know. Why did they even think of that? Did we touch the touch up on that during an episode or something? We did. We did, yeah. But they they just have too much time on their hands, too too much intelligence. They don't know what to do with. So they built. So they just, started their own space program. Yes. Star Wars: The Nobody Edition. <laughs> it's like Minecraft for nobodies. I think that's all I have to say on the nobodies. Peace out. I mean, I could go into the organization, but I could have that on its own podcast. Yeah, the nobodies are, like the Heartless, they're pretty important to the story, but they're not nearly as much of a force. Mm -hmm. It's more like the organization, who happens to have some minions. Yeah, pretty much. And a few replicas here and there. Yeah. It's like, they're neat, and we need more. That's about it. Yeah. Moving right along then. The third enemy type introduced in Birth by Sleep. Eon first. The ones that make the least amount of sense. But we accept it anyway. Reluctantly. <laughs> Alright, so, story-wise, the Unversed are born from the feelings of Vanitas. Whatever that really means. Because why the heck not? I think it's only the negative feelings of Vanitas. But then again, can he really feel positive feelings? Probably not. Mm. Oh, that's a tough question. Anger and hate are supreme. Anyway, I think a lot of them, from what I thought they were going to be, I thought they were going to be, every Unverse was a different emotion that Vanitas had, but I guess they didn't decide to go that route. I was a bit disappointed. that might be true. They are made so that each one of them has a pretty expressive, at least their eyes are fairly expressive. So maybe each one was supposed to have an emotion that was associated with it. Yeah, but they didn't really touch up on that too much. I was expecting yeah, one to I be, think they, like, sadness, anger, etc. Yeah. I think they only brought up the fact that they were connected to feelings twice. At the very beginning, when Master Ericus is describing them, and at the end of Ventus's story, when Venetus is talking about how they came from him, and that's about it. And there's not really an explanation on why they appear. Mm-hmm. And how Venetus is doing that, they just kind of are there. Yeah, is he doing them on purpose? Maybe they'll get touched on in the future? No, probably not. Probably not. It'd be nice to give at least a little more explanation, but, you know, whatever. Yeah, it seems like the Unverse are the ones that are going to get the least amount of Mm -hmm. building. They're just kind of skipped over. It's like, they happened, they were fun, time's up. Yeah, like, they had to come up with some kind of enemies that came before Heartless and Nobodies. Mm -hmm. And they just had to shoehorn them in in any way they could. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, why not? But, uh, as far as favorites, Mm. not a lot. (laughs) Design-wise, they're very harsh. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the kind of thing that they all share. Yeah. And a few of them do have a kind of world-specific design like Heartless do, but really not so many. Mm -hmm. The only, let's see, there was... There was the ones that... But the Jelly Glade T was kind of spacey, in a sense, maybe? Uh, not exactly. They were kind of like ghostly creatures or that the they did put them in space, but they also put them in Olympus Coliseum. That's true, I guess. But there was the Mono Trucker for the Dwarf Woodlands. Mm-hmm. There was the Thorn Bite for Enchanted Dominion because of the thorn theme. Mm-hmm. The Vile File for the Dwarf Woodlands because of the poison, I guess. Shoegazer for... Cinderella's uh, Castle uh, Dreams. Yeah, yeah, for Cinderella. And let's see. There were a couple of them for Deep Space. Mm-hmm. The Sonic Blaster and the Glide Winders, the little spaceship-like ones. Yeah. Although the Glide Winders did also show up in the racing yeah. minigame. But they kind of fit there, too, in Disney Town. Because it's like, oh, it's a thing that can race, I guess. And they didn't feel like making cars. Because, you know, mad bumpers were a pain in the butts in the first game. Or in the second game. True. They would have been interesting as uh, racing opponents, mm-hmm. though. And for Neverland, they had a couple. They had the Triple Wrecker yep. and the Wild Bruiser. Element Clusters. Or the... Sorry, that's... I'm looking at the Final Mix and Verse things again. Triple Wrecker, yeah. And a couple for Olympus Coliseum. Mm-hmm. Or, no, really just one. The Buckle, the Buckle Bruiser. Bruiser. Yeah. But they weren't as obvious as, like, the Heartless and... Uh, yeah. But they did. However, with the bosses, they made it rather obvious. 
per category. That's true. Yeah. Each world did get a pretty distinctive Unverse boss. Mm -hmm. Which applied to, I mean, aside from Neverland, which didn't get a... Neverland, Disney Town, and I think Olympus Coliseum didn't have unversed bosses. I think they all had either real people bosses or something. And of course, Keyblade Graveyard, unless you want to count Vanitas Remnant as it. Yeah, I mean, kind of, but, but I don't yeah, really care. Not canon, so whatever. Or optional. But yeah, at least for the first three and Radiant Garden and Deep Space, they got something with the world. Like the Cursed Coach for Cinderella, the Wheel Master for the Enchanted Dominion, the Mad Ter sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this word, but Treant or Terrant, Treant, something like that. Um, and the Dwarf Woodlands, and of course the Trinity Armor and Radiant Garden, because, you know, three of them were reunited and working out differences and such, so that fit. And, of, and uh, the Metamorphosis in Deep Space, because it's kind of spacey-like, but it's also like an octopus. Symphony Master, I guess, because the ball? Not really sure. But they did a lot better job with the bosses being world-bound than the um, common enemies. And then, of course, they had the Mirage Arena Iron Prisoners. Lots of fun there, especially the third one. I had more trouble with the third one than I did the fourth one. For whatever reason, just because the shapes, I uh, guess, weren't as big as a threat as violently beating you to death. But those were just kind of a pain in the butt for the most part. But they were a neat little addition. And of course there was Mimic Master as well, which was an easier version of the Iron Prisoner in a sense. And I think that's going through all of them, um, besides Vanitas Man Remnant, which was his own little thing. So anyway, the Unverse are pretty much the least developed enemy type, and they're really just... blah. Yeah, they're kind of just there. We're probably never going to see them again. No, probably not. So, on to the final uh, enemy that we will be talking about today. And those are Dream Eaters. Uh, exclusive to Dream Drops Distance, they're the Nightmares and the Spirits. Uh, only existing in the Dream World. Mm-hmm. I really liked, I have to say, I really liked the design of all the Dream Eaters. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, in comparison to, like, the Unversed, I think it was, like, a huge step up and really imaginative. Basically, I think it was a huge improvement over the enemy design and conception overall from Birth by Sleep. Definitely. They were uh, also uh, really, really colorful, and I really like that. They seemed to fit the uh, dream realm very well by making them... Just full of colors and full of fun designs and everything. That's true. We were talking before about how the Heartless were like Pokemon with all the whimsical designs. Mm -hmm. And then like they took that a step further with Dream Eaters. Uh, especially with the spirits, they added the idea of adding them to your party. So even mm -hmm. more of a Pokemon vibe going on there. Oh yeah, and you got definitely a uh, more personal connection with them when you got to see them on your camera so they could be lying on your floor or <laughs> your bed or something and you got to pet them. So they definitely added to the uh, Pokemon X aspect there. Yeah, I really liked how, you know, that all the other enemy types, uh, or the Heartless and the Unversed were very kind of random. You had some that were kind of beast-like. And most of them were, like, monsters, just of mm -hmm. different odd sorts. Mm -hmm. Like, you'll have the Dark Thorn, which is just this big monster guy. And on the other hand, you'll have... Uh, A moving statue. Yeah, statues or bags of gold. And mm -hmm. it's just these completely out-of-nowhere things. And, of course, nobodies were all basically humanoid. Mm -hmm. Well, the Dream Eaters... And I, I like how they went all of them with animal uh, designs. That I thought mm -hmm. that was really cool. Yeah, you can definitely tell uh, what animals they came from. Spare for the ghost Abaki, which was a ghost, but they made him, and the jest Abaki as well. But That's true. they they made them almost animal-like, so yeah, they they came around in that aspect. And they even did some things where they made some animal hybrids like the uh, Meow Wows. They made like <laughs> sort of catty 
and sort of dog as well. I, re- and- I, I, I still find it funny how when it first um, was revealed and everyone was trying to figure out it, the names. First of all, like the names, I thought that was also a really cool choice that they made to combine the Japanese and English mm-hmm. unlike the uh, the other types. Hardless Nobodies and uh, Unversed all basically were English or English-ish names. Yeah, they they did a good job with uh, translating. There were a few things that, uh, from what I heard at least, I don't remember too much from the uh, Japanese names. I remember a few, but there were some of them where there were puns in the Japanese names, but it would get lost in translation. So they ended up changing them, and I think they did a really good job with that. Uh, you mean for the Dream Eaters? Yes. Um, like, for example, I think uh, the Meow Wow... Let me see if that I That one was, was really clever, I thought. Because, well, first of all, I was going to say before, I remember how when the name, the Japanese name for the Meow Wow came out, and everyone was trying to figure it out, and, and it was like, the Wonder Meow. Yeah. And the only thing I could think of is, it kind of looks like a dog to me. And mm-hmm. Juan is barking, and Jan is meowing, and I don't see how you guys aren't seeing this. And yeah. and then it uh, then it came out as it was, and so I was okay with that. Yeah, and I I liked how people that there was a little worry going on, like it's a cat. No, it's a dog. It's it's definitely more dog like than cat like. But the name and everything, and then they actually covered it in the journal entry where it says like cat or dog, boy or girl, friend or fiend, <laughs> and it's like oh yeah, we don't they, they don't even know. So that was on purpose. Surprise! Yeah, surprise. So I found that kind of, I found that kind of funny when I was reading that. Yeah, definitely. Um, did you have did you happen to uh, have any favorites among the Dream Eaters? Is uh, the spirit specifically a couple? I kind of have a soft spot for the Thunderaff. Mm. I think that's mm-hmm. really cool, and uh, I guess I kind of like the E Glider and maybe the Halberd. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, those are all pretty cool ones. I kind of have a thing for Birds of Prey, so I thought those were cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, personally, I mean, the Meow Wow, you just kind of had to love. Everybody fell in love with that one. Yeah. I think that was one of the first ones that was revealed, or and like the different forms of And it turned wow, out like... to be pretty big in the story. Like oh, those, yeah. Like the Meow Wow and the uh, Komori Bat ended up being very important in the story, at least mm-hmm. for a couple of moments. Yeah. I think that's they kind of went with them as the defaults for that purpose, uh, just to say those are the ones included, and uh, we're going to stick with those, because you can't really Im- implant some Dream Eaters that you don't know that the players might not make at all. Yeah. So. And, it, you know, it's a nice touch that the Dream Eaters that uh, started the journey with Sora and Riku were very important at the end. Mm-hmm. Especially with Sora going back to them and uh, and the the Dream Eaters greeting him. And one of the first ones, I think the first one was the Meow Wow, and the second one was the Komori Bat. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think think the Bat might have been the third. Yeah, there might have been something else in there, too. Yeah, I think the Panda was the second one. Oh, yeah, that's right, because he runs in behind him. Yeah. That was still pretty big in the story, too, I felt. I don't know why, maybe just for me personally, because that was one of the first ones I got, so... So the panda, the pandas were uh, some of my favorites too. It's hard to pick favorites though because I liked a lot of them. <laughs> um, but kind of going over some of them, the Skelter Wilds I felt were really cool. <laughs> that was like bones, but it was like colorful and it was fun. A giant and, colorful skeleton that separates yeah, its head and <laughs> flies around. It's it was pretty cool. Yeah, it's not something you see every day, definitely. But I'm glad I got to see it. Um, some of the bears were kind of cool, and I think the last one, uh, was the Tama sheep. It was adorable to me, at least. That's I true. Loved it. That one was fairly cute. hmm So, moving on to Nightmares, then. Were there any, uh, that struck you as, whoa, that's neat, or, uh, You mean, like, anything? Nightmares in general, or the Nightmare bosses? Um, in general. You can go bosses or, uh, little ones. Um, Commoners. I don't know if any of the small fry stood out as far as, like, nightmares, mm-hmm. but for bosses, I thought the, <laughs> I thought the mole was pretty cool. It was yeah, pretty that funny. Was, 
I like what they did with his battle, too, making him go out of the ceiling and out of the floor and in the walls. I mean, that was aggravating as crap, but... Yeah. I mean, that was pretty cool. Yeah, all of the Dream Eater bosses, in some way, shape, or form, were a pain in the butt. At least for me. Especially the uh, War Goyle, because you're such at a low level at that point, where there's not much you can do. And Was there a particular version you found more annoying than the other? Um, Riku's is kind of annoying because of the flying, but I felt like Sora's was more difficult for me. Maybe because I did Sora's first and I wasn't exactly knowing what I was getting into. But I would have to say Sora's personally. What about you? Was there any bosses, uh, even even if it's not the War Goyle? Hmm... That's a good question. I don't know if I can pick one, but I'll tell you the different, the two different versions of the. Oh crap! What was the name of the first one? Oh, the Hako Monkey. Yeah, that one. That was so. Oh man, that guy was crazy. Yeah. And then he breaks the floor, and you go into that other room, and it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. At least for Sora's story. I think for Riku's as well. I think it's basically the same battle. As well, as far as I remember. I mean, he had two different versions. The one where, I, I guess you can think of it as the boxing glove version and the magician's, uh, yeah. magician sleeves version. Yeah, that's right. Think, didn't Riku start in the garden? Yes. Where Sora started on the top and went to the garden. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, and you don't necessarily end up going into the garden if you, I guess, steer clear of the skylight. That's true. The Char Clopster and the Chill Clopster were pretty neat, too. I didn't find them overly difficult, but they were just kind of fun to battle. I think I want to say those were my favorite Dream Eater bosses, were the lobsters. I would say the Char Clopster was a little weird because of the flipping the arena mechanic. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's never a fun mechanic. Yeah, but with flow motion, it makes it a bit easier to do that. Yeah. But you still kind of have to keep flipping the whale. (laughs) Flipping the whale. That sounds (laughs) like a crazy euphemism there. Yeah. It's like flipping the bird only. If you'll excuse me, I'll go flip the whale. <laughs> Pardon me while I flip the whale. <laughs> it even it either sounds like you're uh, tossing your cookies or flipping the bird. I can't decide which. <laughs> or besides the direct dream eater things, the only two I guess you can call intelligent beings were the uh, armored Ventus's nightmare and the anti black coat, which I look forward to see. Um, what the anti-black coat was. I hope that comes back in three. That would be interesting, but I think... I feel like there's more than what meets the eye. Maybe, but I feel like it was just a manifestation of what was going on in Sora's dreams at the time. I I don't think it'll be coming back, personally. See, I would agree with that, except the journal entry says, uh, a mysterious menace clad in a black coat. And usually those that are clad in black coats are meant to be kept hidden. And um, it says mysterious, so I I want to say there's more. But at least that's what I think. Maybe they'll never touch on again. Just like, oh, just a manifestation of source dreams. Moving on. That's entirely possible. Yeah. We'll see. But only time will tell. Mm -hmm. And then there were the two that only appeared during uh, the dive mode. Mm Mm-hmm. The, uh, yes. The Queen Buzzerfly. Mm-hmm. And... The Brawlamari, I believe? Yeah, yeah Brawlamari. Right. Those I were... haven't pulled up here. <laughs> um, the Brawlamari, I think he was... He was one of the first ones, wasn't he? I think so. I think both of them appeared kind of early-ish, but then later on they switched characters. Yeah, that seems right. Oh, it was for the Greed in the Country of the Musketeers, it says here. So, maybe it wasn't, but... Well, the grid was fairly early. Yeah, the first was... group of worlds. Mm-hmm. But I didn't find the Brawlamaris. There's two versions of it, but the Brawlamaris I didn't find too overly difficult, personally. On the other hand, the Queen Buzzerfly, um, especially getting A rank, it was difficult to get the top tier award for the Queen Buzzerfly because. Yeah, the way that they set it up was you had to hit the gem on the top of her head, but before you had to do that, you defeat, like, four of these, like, smaller bees. Yeah. And you had to do it in, like, a certain combo, and only sometimes would you be able to get all four bees in the same combo. And it was just a pain in the butt to get it within the time limit, because if you didn't get it at the first try, then you didn't get gold. Yeah, so you, you had to be able to 
get everything done perfectly. You had to have, like, the perfect plan for going through each step of taking out the little minions and then hitting the weak points. And you had to hit her as much as you could, or else, uh, if you didn't get enough HP, then you're not gonna make it. And you're gonna end up with, like, one HP when you go back for her again. And then it's like, oh, now I have to go for a third round, and that cuts it off, so. (laughs) That was a bit upsetting there. So I found her moderately difficult in that aspect. Fair enough. Um... I think that's all I wanted to say. Maybe that the Spellican was the pain in the butt, too. <laughs> <laughs> in Fantasia Land. Come on. Symphony of Sorcery? Thank you. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. The Symphony of Sorcery. We are terrible with names today. I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens. No, me too. It's right in front of me, too. I see it. Symphony of Sorcery. I don't know why. But, yeah. Uh, it was difficult to catch up and keep your HP... And then it was, and then he delivered some pretty strong blows uh, once you were in the area where you actually hurt him. Yeah. I, I think that's all I wanted to say as far as the Dream Eater aspect. Is there anything else you want to add, New Mints? Yeah, kind of. I was talking before about how much better I thought the Dream Eaters were compared to, like, the Unburst. Mm-hmm. I remember we, ta- we were talking before about how in Birth by Sleep, the Unverse seemed like a very tacked-on element. Mm-hmm. They didn't really have much of a story. Like, at the very end, you find out that they're related to Vinitas, and it still feels very not well thought out. Mm-hmm. It feels like they just needed an enemy, so they shoehorned them in. Yeah, right. But with the Dream Eaters, from the very beginning... They wrote them, the Dream Eaters, into the new world that they were describing, the Sleeping Realm. And it just felt so much better that they did that. Yeah. And I don't know if they had any um, original intentions with the enemies from Birth by Sleep, but I remember a trailer uh, showing it was either Dark Side or Guard Armor. But there was, um, it was originally planned to have Heartless in the game, but I think they switched over um, not only rather early, which probably helped. But they did a good job of it as well. That's true. In the promotional media, they had Sora fighting a Twilight Thorn in Traverse Town. That's it. That's it. I'm sorry. It was the Twilight Thorn, and they were originally planning to have nobodies. Yeah. That would also have been interesting, but... I'm sure they could have done, uh, done with nobodies as well, too, with the whole Organization 13. But I'm glad they went with the route with the Dream Eaters. Yeah. Um, and with that, uh, any last notes from you, Nes- new man? Oh, yeah. So, we know that the Dream Eaters were created for Dream Drop Distance and the story therein. Right. But, since we now know, uh, if you've been oh, following, yes. if you've been following the story from Kingdom Hearts Key, uh, you know that Dream Eaters have made an appearance there, which creates kind of huge implications for the story in Kingdom Hearts Kai and the return of Dream Eaters. It's kind of interesting to see uh, that they brought back the Dream Eaters and the implications that that come with them. So mm-hmm. I think that would be really cool to see. Yeah, definitely. So it's So we might see the return of the Dream Eaters. And I'm also using that as a basis to see if they bring back the anti-black coat as well. But perhaps, perhaps not. Yeah, we'll have to see how the story of Kingdom Hearts Kai ends. But it'll be fun to uh, see the Dream Eaters again if they do choose to bring them back for three. Yeah. As an enemy or as allies. I think we can probably say that in Kingdom Hearts 3, we're not going to have any new... Enemy types. Mm-hmm. I think we'll see Heartless, of course, and Nobodies. Well, we will probably see Nobodies. Yeah, I think the only returning enemy we can confirm, um, of course, not confirming anything, of course. Uh, but I want to say that on Verse, we most likely won't be seeing again. Probably As for not. the other three, I see a very possible return for all three of those. Yeah, maybe less so for Dream Eaters, but that will depend on how. I feel like that depends on how Kai ends. Yeah, and how that plays out with the story, definitely. Yeah. Either way, uh, I look forward to it, and I don't, I don't see them 
coming in with a new enemy either because of the closing of the Xanort saga and just trying to pull everything together, um, setting a new enemy would feel thrown in and last minute. Like, Incidentally, do you think uh, once they go beyond the Xehanort saga, do you think they'll be bringing in different enemy types, or do you think they'll be sticking with uh, the ones they've got? Oh, well, I mean, it depends how far they plan on going. If they plan on doing, like, one more thing for the Z- uh as long as the Xehanort saga was, there's a possibility, but I think if they plan on going with, like, multiple sagas as, sagas as long as this one was, I would say there's definitely going to be a new type of enemy. Of course, I don't know the direction they'll be, they're going, but it's quite possible that they'll bring in something new, but they'll probably still keep the old types as well, especially with the Heartless. They'll, that's they'll the certainly main. keep the Heartless and yeah. possibly nobodies. They might drop Dream Eaters after uh, 3, but we're definitely going to be keeping the Heartless, and we might see a new type of enemy, and that's exciting as well. And I look yeah. forward to seeing those as yeah, so far we don't have any even any hints about what uh, future stories might be after the Xehanort saga ends. Mm-hmm. So I guess we'll have that to look forward to. Yeah, definitely. I kind of would like to see more inhabitants of the Realm of Darkness. I feel like just having Heartless there is kind of dull. Yeah, I'm sure they could definitely plant something that... Um, um, I don't know how they plan on doing it, if they will or how they could do it. But I could definitely see them uh, bringing out a new enemy that's, I don't know, an idea could be something like uh, the Root of the Pure Bloods or something. Maybe they spawned off a previous enemy or something that originated from the darkness. I don't know. <laughs> Precursors. Precursors. <laughs> Pro- prologuing the prologue. <laughs> uh, of course, that'd be a curveball that I could see Nomura throwing out. And I hope not. It would end up being Assassin's Creed Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But only time will tell. The future is before us. Yeah. By the way, now I want to see some Kingdom Hearts Assassin's Creed crossover artwork. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Please send that to us. I would love to see that. I'm sure there's stuff already out there if I look on Google Images, but... Later. That that might be fun. Not as a legit crossover, but... <laughs> I'd like to see some smarter versions of, I mean, we have the Vented Armor Nightmare and the uh, Red Eyes, but I kind of see a, a few more intelligent versions of the Dream Eaters and the Heartless, just because the only really intelligent Heartless was uh, in some Secret of Darkness, so it'd be cool to see what ideals could clash there. Yeah. And it'd, it'd just be cool to see their designs overall. Yeah, that would be interesting. And maybe some of the, uh, some more common nobodies, too. Well, yeah. We definitely need to see some more of those. Mm-hmm. We need to see minions for all the other members. The ones that were, that were not around by Kingdom Hearts 2. Yeah, the Castle Oblivion 5. I, w- I would definitely like to see them get their own little things. Mm-hmm. Kingdom Hearts 3, bring us stuff. Bring us stuff. Bring us stuff. There we are. Any last notes to uh, add to this new man's? Uh, I don't think so. I think we covered everything pretty thoroughly. I do believe we do. I don't think there's any more enemy types I can think of. <laughs> Unless we... Well, I mean, there were more enemies, but but they don't really have a type. I mean, like Disney villains and Square Enix bosses and Riku. But they each have their little thing that doesn't really need covering so yeah character enemies yeah they speak for themselves mm-hmm. all right so with that i this podcast comes to a close once again yeah yay and we will see how things turn out in the future and we can appreciate the pretty awesome work that went into the design of the different enemy types that we've been facing throughout the series Except for maybe uh, Unversed, because, you know, screw those guys. Yeah, screw the Unversed. We don't need them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for joining us once again in the round room. We hope to see you guys next time. Uh, Mm -hmm. See you in a month, which will be shorter than you think it is. (laughs) Well, here's hoping. (laughs) Definitely. 
All right, so until next episode, I am Nezzy. And I am Chain of Fire. See you guys next time. We will see you next time. Peace out. Later.